was the belief of the Hindus that the Atlantean distribution began with a race of giants. They believed that in those ancient times the human being was considerably larger than he is now. And some have gone as so far as to point out that remains, human fossilized remains of gigantic statue have actually been found. These were the giants of Genesis, the giants of the book of Enoch, the giants of the Zohar, and other books which deal with the antediluvian world. We are not surprised or amazed when we uh, reconstruct uh, the skeletal remains of the Denosaur or the Brontosaurus or any of these vast prehistoric mammals. We are not surprised to learn that there were bats 12 or 15 feet of wing spread, uh, that there were animals 40, 50, 60 feet in length or more, uh, that there were birds that were larger than any bird that we know today, that reptiles and other forms of life went mad in their form constructions, and that this earth was populated with monsters. Monsters as described by Besaurus in his Phoenician and Chaldean history. Monsters of long ago. These were the dragons of ancient China. These were the strange shadowy monsters that arise in the nightmare folklore. Now if we go back to our Indic mythology and our Chinese mythology with which we are especially concerned, we note something of great interest to this point. Nearly all of the ancient heroes, the ancient gods and godlings of the East were giants. When represented in statuary or carving, they are always represented larger. They are represented as of mammoth proportions. We have every reason to believe, from what we know, that to them the serpent was the symbol of God. We have also reason to believe that as was later used by the Egyptians and several of the early Phoenician historians and Roman historians were convinced, as we mentioned before, that the Egyptians were the Atlanteans who could not go home because of the destruction of their land after their invasion of Athens or attempt to invade Athens. The royal symbol of the Egyptians was the serpent coiled upon the forehead of the solar crown. We also know that this serpent appears wherever we have the motion of the so-called Atlantean or Mongolian culture. We have the mysterious serpents of Gobi. We have the serpent in the symbolism of Tibet and China. We have the serpent gradually metamorphosed into the five-clawed dragon, the imperial symbol of China. A strange and wonderful emblem. We know that the dragon lore and the dragon symbol came more and more to be associated with the magician and the sorcerer. We also have the mysterious serpents of Latin America. Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, was a good deity, not an evil one. These symbolisms of the serpent, the serpent with a raised head, we have generally associated with the serpent of evil. But even in the Bible, we are told, be wise as serpents and as gentle as doves, harmless as doves. The combination of the bird and the serpent, the feathered serpent of Gobi, Mongolia, the flying seraphs, the symbols always of the ancient initiate kings, the symbols of the secret masters of magic in ancient times. And it is believed that by this, the Druids, who received it also, and used it twisted as a serpent symbol around the Orphic egg. That among these ancient peoples, this symbol had to do with the magnetic field of the earth. Believing that his own will is stronger than universal will. Believing that his own desires are greater than universal desires that this constitutes the disobedience referred to. This is also, of course, the basis of the rebellion of Lucifer. And in the rebellion of Lucifer, 
and his destruction by the archangel Michael, the casting of Lucifer into the abyss, together with the great monster, and all this vast accumulation of heavenly stars, this battle between the psychopompus of heaven, the army chaplain and master of the Lord, and Lucifer, seems to suggest again a parallel to the Atlantic deluge. The casting of Lucifer into the abyss seems to have to do with the humbling of great pride. But times have changed, folks. The study of brainwashing and mind control and conditioning the mind within the past decade or so has helped to lay bare the essence of the mysteries and has answered the riddles which surrounded them. You see in this process those who had tried to keep the celebration of the mysteries alive, who had tried to revive them, have been shown up as relying upon the symbolic interpretation alone. So let us return to a sketch 
of the conventional knowledge about the mysteries. In those of Eleusis, celebrated in Greece, the candidate had to undergo fasting or abstinence from certain foods. There were processions with sacred statues carried from Athens to Eleusis. Those who were to be initiated waited for long periods of time outside the hall in the temple where the rites were to be held, building up a tremendous tension of suspense. Eventually, a torchbearer led them within the precincts, usually underground. The ceremonies included a ritualistic meal, one or two dramas, the exhibition of sacred objects, the giving of the word. 